good afternoon my sweet friends and welcome back to peaceful for gardens my name is danny and today i wanted to talk to you about ground covers and turf lawn turf lawn or ground cover ground cover or turf lawn so um first though i wanted to show you my shirt it says botany plants lately <laughs> botany botany you know botany botany plants lately i'm so punny i crack myself up <laughs> so Anyway, so why did I want to talk about this today? Red tide. Red tide. We live in the Tampa Bay area and red tide is a really big problem for us a lot of the times, but and particularly right now, the levels are particularly high. What is red tide? We live in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, red tide is a marine organism. So red tide is a dinoflagellate called, uh, the scientific name is Corinia brevis. They produce a toxin called brevitoxin. In our area, we deal with um, algal harmful, what are called harmful algal blooms or HABs. And while yes, they are a naturally occurring, really cool <laughs> organism in our in our waters, they we have contributed to the unnatural abundance of them with things like nutrient runoff and pollution we have created these harmful algal blooms why those are why those habs or harmful algal blooms are bad for the environment and for the humans is because of that brevitoxin brevitoxin affects the respiratory system of fish birds eat fish fish eat other fish you know there's a cycle that goes on out there birds sometimes eat sick fish sometimes eat dead, dying fish. When I was in animal rehab, when I was rehabbing seabirds, this was the one major issue that we dealt with specifically when it came to double-crested cormorants. So double-crested cormorants are particularly susceptible to brevitoxin. They get this kind of effect where they are, look, they look like they're drunk, but also wired and caffeinated all at the same time. It really affects, affects them um, and can kill them. In this area, rehabbers have come up with protocols specifically for dealing with red tide toxicity when it comes to birds. They also cause mass fish kill-offs, massive fish die-offs which creates human issue, you know, on the beaches. I don't know if you've ever been, if you live in this area and you've ever been to the beach around red tide when there was a massive fish kill, it's awful. It's, it's awful. It's, the smell is just horrendous. Not only that, but that brevitoxin can actually, once it's aerosolized, can create issues for human beings as well. So I'm particularly susceptible to brevitoxin. I get really kind of constricted air. It's very itchy. You know, my eyes are itchy. It's just, I just don't feel good. I just don't feel good when I'm around it. So I have to avoid the beach when there's high levels of red tide. That's why it's such a big issue it just creates not only you know environmental impacts you know devastating environmental impacts but it also affects our tourism you know it affects our health so it, it's an issue it's an absolute issue if we're talking about plants why am i discussing a marine dinoflagellate you ask so glad you asked that question so turf lawns require fertilizer in my experience what is a turf lawn it, particularly in this area people love turf lawns they're ubiquitous. Turf lawn is grass that people have grown purposely to have that really dense, thick carpet. And that takes some inputs to get that really nice, dense, thick green carpet of grass. So grass is in, turf lawns themselves, so grasses are amazing, but turf lawn, the, the idea of a turf lawn actually goes back a long way. I'll just give you like the teeny tiny back of the matchbook. <laughs> <laughs> trivia on, on turf lawns. So they originally used them around like castles and, you know, estates and things like that a long time ago so that they could see people and invaders coming from, you know, long distances away. And then I think they were used as a form of wealth, you know, like they were a sign of wealth at one point to have a really lovely, you know, lawn at one time that you had to have people take care of for you because there were no lawnmowers back in these times. 
that was a sign of wealth. But during those times, they weren't using Bahia and St. Augustine. They were using herbs like chamomile and thyme and, you know, things that flowered. Not to say that turf lawn can't flower, it's just we never let it do that. Why don't we have a turf lawn? Because I'm not going to shit on you. If you should, I'm not going to shit on you. So I'm not going to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. We decided not to have a turf lawn because, well, we went through trying to have a turf lawn. It takes an incredible incredible amount of water, fertilizer, pesticides to keep things from eating it. And then the number one, I guess, turf choice here in, in our area or the one that I've consulted with people on is St. Augustine. So St. Augustine is technically native, but it was shipped off to other places, hybridized with other plants and brought back. So it's not strictly speaking native, the St. Augustine that people use in their turf lawns. They prefer more moist conditions. So when we throw them into the environments that we're throwing them in, they're going to need some babying. They just are. And this is my experience, you know, of people having lawns and trying to help them get that beautiful, perfect green lawn that they're looking for. So I get tired of doing that. <laughs> and not only that, but all of that nutrient input, all of that, you know, all of that water, it's so wasteful in my opinion. Not to mention the nutrient runoff is contributing to our ecological disasters that, you know, are happening with, you know, red tide and, and other issues. Because it's not just red tide that that's a problem for. It's a problem for all sorts of, you know, things. We converted to a ground cover. And I want to say really quickly too. So this issue is so bad that we have a municipal fertilizer ban in our area during the rainy season because they know you know we know we know it's an issue we know our clean water is at stake yet we still do the same thing with you know fertilizers and, and things like that we have chosen to step outside of that system and go a more natural holistic less impactful wet ground covers before i get into ground covers I want to mention my absolute favorite native plant nursery in the area. That would be Wilcox Nursery and Landscape over in Indian Rocks Beach. They are not sponsoring this. They have been, they don't even have any idea I'm mentioning them. <laughs> they are my go-to native plant nursery in the area. Full disclosure, I did work for them for a short time. There was a reason for that because I, I believed in the people that work there. I really love the people that work there. I believe in what they're trying to do. The owner, Zach, is a, is a lovely guy. Check out Wilcox um, Native Plant Nursery over in Indian Rocks Road. I will leave a link to their website in the description below. All of these ground covers you can get at that I'm going to describe to you in the rest of the video, you can find those at Wilcox Nursery and Landscape. Availability depending, you know, what's a ground cover? So a ground cover is essentially a plant that covers the ground. <laughs> it's really, you know, I mean, technically speaking, grass is a ground cover. I prefer to use native ground covers. Native ground cover, so it's important to cover the ground. Covering the ground suppresses weeds. That's the big one. It does suppress weeds. It provides flowers for pollinators because a lot of ground covers have little beautiful flowers on them, so they provide benefit to pollinators. You know, they keep the they keep the plants roots, you know, where they're growing over top of. They keep those roots cool, you know, in the summertime. So there's so many benefits to to ground covers. The nice thing about a lot of these native ground covers is that they're ridiculously hardy. Now I want to say not all native plants are going to be perfect in every situation. That's absolutely not true. You know native plants are fantastic but right plant right place. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't put a I guess a sand hill scrub plant you know in a system that was more designated for you know acidic you know organic type soil. That just wouldn't work out well. I've, I've done that. I've killed some scrub sandhill plants trying to <laughs> mulch them to death. That's, that's, you know, right plant, right place. There are wonderful ground covers for pretty much any, I, I've discovered pretty much any situation that you might have. First one I want to talk about is salvia micella. So salvia micella is creeping sage, and I will show a, a, a picture of it. Um, so that you can see it. So creeping sage or river sage, it's a beautiful little low growing plant. It can handle a lot of shade. That was the one thing that drew me to it. It loves, it, it really thrives in some shade. It doesn't like to be overly dry. 
it can die back a little bit. It'll, it'll defoliate a bit. I've noticed if it's too dry, it does really well even in dry sites. You know, a little bit of defoliation to me is no big deal. It's still doing it. You know what I'm saying? We've even dropped <laughs> lots and lots of mulch on our creeping sage on accident in the process of, you know, establishing this habitat. And it bounce back beautifully. So salvia micella or creeping sage, it has a smell to it. It has like a sage kind of a smell. I have read in certain places that it's edible. If I tell you to eat something, don't eat it. But I've heard that it's edible. I need to do a little more research on that. But I love native edibles. So I will definitely be looking into it. It has a little purplish blue flower that the pollinators go insane for. It just spreads like crazy so it would make a fantastic ground cover where there's not a lot of foot traffic and things like that because it doesn't necessarily want to be stepped on or you can but it doesn't like it or mowed or anything like that another one though that does like doesn't mind being stepped on i've edged it i've even weeded it just a, a small amount is phyla nutiflora or matchweed frog fruit. You've probably seen it in disturbed sites, drier areas. It can also handle a little bit of shade, but it really does thrive in, um, in full sun. It, it does really well in full sun. We have it growing in all kinds of mixed areas and it just does beautifully. It just spreads indeterminately. It has this tiny little flower on it that looks like a match head, which is probably what they call it matchweed. The pollinators go insane for it. I believe it's the host plant for like four different species of um, butterfly. This one's probably one of my favorite ground covers for, I guess, tough, you know, areas because it's weedy in that way, but it's a good thing. Like, it's a good thing that it's that weedy in this particular instance. Because like I said, you can walk on it, you can edge it, and it's, it's a tough little plant. So I've actually had helped someone convert almost their entire lawn over to matchweed and they were thrilled. Third one um, that is more suited to like coastal, sandy, maybe sunny, you know, drier areas would be Helianthus debilis. Um, it's dune or west coast uh, dune sunflower. So that one's really beautiful. I actually planted that. Um, it's part of our landscaping in a very sunny area at our spiritual center and it looks gorgeous. So there's all these beautiful little daisy yellow sunflower like you know little beauties just kind of smiling at you as soon as you walk in as soon as you drive into the to the complex so it's a lovely little plant i wouldn't necessarily put it in shade it gets very luggy we have it in some shady areas here it's okay but it definitely gets a little bit leggy those are three absolutely fantastic native plants that you can use as an alternative to say you know a turf lawn they don't require fertilizer they don't require fertilizer no, they don't require fertilizer, guys. They do need watering in the beginning, but once they're established, you're golden. So, native ground covers. Now, does this mean that I'm telling you that you should, I told you I went and shouldn't on you, that you should, you know, replace, get rid of your entire lawn? No, of course not. Of course not. You know, but give yourself a break. Do a little bit less work. Spend a little bit less money. Maybe convert over part of your lawn, you know, to a ground cover. See how it goes. You know, if you're tired of fighting with your lawn, this might be a way to go. That's really what we wanted to talk about today, ground covers and turf lawn. If you're interested in this content, Florida native plants, food forests, um, gardening for wildlife, subscribe to our channel. Give us a like. We hope to see you again at Peaceful Bird Gardens. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a lovely day.